So we are walking into the Zika forest right now. We're with our pals from the Ugandan Virus Research Institute. We are gonna set up some insect traps and discover new viruses. This tower is to study which mosquitoes bite at different levels. Mm -hmm. You can see those extensions. Yeah. They could put a monkey in a cage, and then mosquitoes come and bite these animals. The aim was to study yellow fever transmission. But in the process, they got another virus. It was named Zika virus. So this is the, the very tower that was used to discover the original Zika virus. Uh, exactly. it, was, it was right here. Long before the Zika outbreak in Brazil caused global panic, it was first discovered here in Uganda in 1947. Pathogens are constantly mutating and acquiring new traits, so researchers monitor the mosquitoes to track the emerging infections that could ignite the next pandemic. Okay. There are mosquitoes flying all around me right now. Doesn't fill me with warm and fuzzies. Tropical forests like this are breeding grounds for new viruses. Once untouched, human populations now destroy around 7 million hectares of forest each year, allowing diseases to have an easier time getting into human populations. There are houses right there. There's been encroachment upon the forest, and the airport is just past the houses. What are the implications of people living so close to this forest? They are targets for viruses that are within this forest. We expect high cases of emerging and re-emerging infections into the populations. Each year, a million people are killed by diseases transmitted from mosquitoes. And with increasing temperatures and population growth, that death toll is expected to climb in the coming years. Zika vaccine trials are progressing right now, and even though it's daunting to vaccinate the entire world, scientists have proven they can eliminate threats. In 1967, the World Health Organization launched a campaign to eliminate one of the biggest killers in human history. Dr. Larry Brilliant was part of the team that eradicated smallpox using a very simple concept. Instead of going all through India or Bangladesh and trying to vaccinate everybody, we got the idea that if we gave the vaccine only to those who were closest to an infected person, and you put a ring around every infected person with your scarce vaccine, you would abort the epidemic. And that's what worked. We have a lot of vaccines, but the vaccines we have are for known viruses. When the next unknown virus jumps from an animal to a human, we're not gonna have a vaccine on day one. These live bird markets are prevalent throughout the developing world, and the tight quarters that these animals are in make it very easy for pathogens and infectious disease to spread from animals to humans. Almost 70% of human infections actually come from animals. Dr. Dennis Biarugaba investigates the threat of avian influenza in live bird markets. Standing there, yeah. you could uh, smell some little bit of uh, stuff yeah. from the, the cages. Now, these are aerosols that are coming from the cages, and should there be any infection in those cages, you're automatically inhaling them. So that smell that I was smelling over there, what you're referring to as an aerosol, <laughs> is potentially really bad for yeah, us. Yeah, if there was any uh, potential pathogen that was within those poultry, the likelihood that you'd pick it up from those aerosols as the birds fluff their feathers is very high. There is a high concentration of poultry from different regions where they are exposed and come in with different infections. There is slaughtering of uh, these birds within the markets in very unhygienic conditions. And if these are zoonotic, then you expose and get this infection into the human population. Could you define or explain what zoonosis is? A zoonosis is a disease that is transmitted from animals to humans. The typical example is, for example, influenza, and there are quite many. With the population increases in these countries, should the world be afraid of a crazy bird flu pandemic at a level that we've never seen before? For now, the major threat actually is those diseases that we are unable to find treatment for or contain. Each zoonotic disease poses a unique threat. 
transmitted from bodily fluids, the deadly Ebola epidemic was exacerbated by the poorly developed health systems and living conditions in West Africa. The SARS outbreak was less lethal, but struck wealthy countries as it went airborne and spread between people and cities and hospitals. We are truly in the middle of the evolution of an epidemic. Global health systems were unprepared as these diseases devastated people around the globe. But if a disease as deadly as Ebola could transmit through the air like SARS, the consequences would be dire. In the Netherlands, a scientist proved just how easily this mutation could occur. Dr. Ron Fouchier demonstrated how he genetically modified the H5N1 bird flu virus to transmit through the air. We took an avian H5N1 bird flu virus, which is normal fecal oral transmitted, and we genetically modified it to investigate what it would take to turn this into an airborne transmissible virus in humans. So how exactly did you pull it off? We took information from the pandemic viruses of the last century and engineered a bird flu virus to have some of these mutations. And the idea is very simple. You have a ferret in one cage that you inoculate with a virus. And these two animals are separated by two steel grids. So if the animal on the right becomes infected, the virus must have traveled through the air from the ferret on the left. All pandemic strains of flu the last century had acquired this trait of airborne transmission. We only needed five substitutions in two different genes uh, for this virus to become airborne. Deadly airborne virus is potentially a nightmare scenario. So why create it? To prove that the H5N1 bird flu virus could acquire the traits of becoming airborne transmissible. So now we can find out exactly what it takes for an animal virus to become airborne. Despite the breakthrough of his findings, Dr. Fouchier's work sent shockwaves through the international community. There were a lot of concerns about your findings being out in the public. Yes, so when we submitted our manuscript for publication, the US government judged that our manuscript could be used by people to construct biological weapons or terror. We argued that the information that we collected had to be uh, sent back to the countries where outbreaks are occurring to inform the people about what to be on the lookout for. You eventually did publish your findings, is that correct? That's correct. We convinced uh, the World Health Organization to have a meeting with the countries that were facing outbreaks to explain why they would need the information. And so the people in Uganda or in Indonesia or China who do surveillance can be on the lookout for the mutations and the biological traits associated with increased risk. What you're doing in the lab is happening in nature all the time. Absolutely. Flu pandemics happen every 20, 30 years without any involvement of scientists, mad scientists or good scientists. What we did in the lab was nothing different from what is happening in animals around the globe every day. When an animal virus mutates and spreads into the human population, it inevitably causes chaos and panic. As the Ebola crisis spiraled out of control in 2014, the U.S. government spent $2.4 billion in response, more than a quarter of the U.S.'s entire annual global health budget, pushing scientists like Dr. Brilliant to find more preemptive solutions for future outbreaks. We have to strengthen public health in the poorest countries to make ourselves safe. Human beings are only as strong as our weakest surveillance system. This is one instance where America first means working with the poorest countries of the world to protect them out of selfishness, our own enlightened self-interest. Uganda is now at the forefront of deadly disease monitoring with a remarkably effective biosurveillance system that was implemented with the help of American health agencies and the U.S. Army. These motorcycle guys, there's a whole network of them. They ride around, they pick up blood samples, and they take it from the local clinics to the bigger hospitals. It was originally set up to deal with the HIV AIDS epidemic. And then they had the very smart idea to piggyback the examination of the blood samples for other infections like Ebola, and SARS, yellow fever. It's very lo-fi and rudimentary and cheap. 
but it's working. Through that surveillance system that is now in place, we are capable of reducing the fatalities and the virus outbreaks are detected early. In 2007, 146 people were infected by a small Ebola outbreak in Uganda. Since then, three outbreaks have emerged here, but this biosurveillance system helped prevent each one from spreading beyond 25 infections. It's not just surveillance of humans, it's surveillance of animals who could carry a virus that we don't know about, but has potential for human disease. We sample from poultry and swine for rapid virus detection, so that immediately we are able to detect it before it spreads out massively to other areas. If we have good pandemic preparation, if we find outbreaks quickly, we won't have that pandemic. It's our option. Outbreaks are inevitable. Pandemics are optional.